Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, the exam solutions are posted um, as well as grades. So take a look at that on Canvas. <clears throat> Let's see, see the class schedule for assignments that are coming up. There's a pre-lab due this week uh, and you will have lab this week and homework four is due next week. My office hours will be right after class if you have any questions and the TA's office hours are also posted if you want to join their office hours. And if you have any questions during class, as always, please chat or unmute and uh, get those questions answered. So I wanted to start today with a preview of Lab 4. So Lab 4 will be about Thevenin equivalent circuits and maximum power transfer. So you're going to work on a circuit that looks like this. You will analyze the circuit and build the circuit and measure the circuit. <clears throat> and what you're going to do is find the Thevenin equivalent of this circuit with lots of resistors, uh, a couple sources, and two terminals. And notice that there's a crossing of two conductors here, but there's no connection. So when you build and analyze this, this circuit, make sure there's no connection right there. OK, and what you're going to create is a Thevenin equivalent circuit that looks like this. And during the pre-lab, you're going to calculate the Thevenin equivalent circuit. And during the lab, you're going to determine the Thevenin equivalent circuit from measurements. So instead of, you know, analyzing the circuit in lab, in lab right, you're going to you're going to do some measurements by connecting different resistors uh, to the output and try to figure out what the Thevenin equivalent is, and then see how that compares to your analysis. So here's that circuit again. What you're going to do is you're going to determine VT, right, as we know now, by measuring VOC. So instead of analyzing the circuit in lab, right, in the pre-lab, you're going to analyze the circuit. But in lab, you're going to measure VOC. So that means uh, don't connect anything to the terminals, remove that RL and just measure with a voltmeter the voltage between A and B, that's VOC. And then you're going to plot VL versus IL, right? the load voltage versus the load current for various values of RL and determine RT uh, using the slope of that plot VL versus IL. Remember this from one of the early lectures on Thevenin equivalence. Right. If you plot uh, voltage versus current for various values of RL, you get a straight line. You're going to see that straight line in lab. My straight line, sort of straight, looked like this when I did the, the measurements. So I took the axes off of this plot. But this set of measurements pretty much matches theory. I get a really straight line. And negative of that slope is the Thevenin resistance. So you're going to do that in lab and create the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Uh, and then you're going to do a maximum power transfer uh, experiment with the circuit. You're going, you're going to calculate and plot power versus various values of RL. And you're going to calculate power versus RL using the Thevenin equivalent circuit. And your plot should look something like this. Uh, you're going to do a plot where you have uh, measurements and um, Thevenin uh, uh, theory from the Thevenin equivalent circuit on the same plot. And they should match pretty closely. These were my measurements and my calculations that matched fairly well. So if you have any questions about that lab or that pre-lab, stop by during office hours and we can chat about that. All right. So let's continue on with the topics that we were covering right before the exam. Which will be here. So we were talking about first order circuits. First order circuits were circuits with uh, resistors and capacitors or resistors and inductors. We left off with, in circuits with only resistors, 
when a source is turned on or there's some sudden change in the circuit, all of the voltages and currents change instantaneously. But when you have capacitors and inductors and resistors uh, in a circuit, then some of the voltages and currents do not change instantaneously. They actually have an exponential change. Um, for, for first order circuits, they have an exponential change. And that change is called a transient response. Whenever I say transient or transient voltage or transient response, that means the time varying change of voltage or current that results from some sudden change in the circuit. And we talked about, well, if you have R's, L's, and C's in a circuit, then you get a second order differential equation. In this class, we're just going to consider first order circuits, which means you'll be dealing with RC circuits or RL circuits, not all three components in the same, um, the same circuit. So what you'll have in the end, when you analyze using KVL, KCL, whatever, you will wind up with a first order differential equation that has this form. We will work an example of that today. And then I mentioned there are two ways to solve uh, a first order circuit. Uh, I will show you both ways. The first way is what I call the general approach. That's where you analyze the circuit KVL, KCL, voltage division, Ohm's law, whatever. You analyze the circuit, you create a differential equation, first order differential equation, and you solve the resulting differential equation. And then the second approach I will show you later is what I call the initial, final, initial and final value approach. That's where you will perform steady state analysis. We'll talk about what that is. And then you'll determine the time constant We'll talk about what that is. And you have a form of the solution that you can just plug some numbers in and get the answer. Both of these uh, approaches are, are valid um, and uh, they're both useful. And so we'll cover both of them. All right, so let's jump right in. Ooh, let's see here. Yeah, let's jump right into the whiteboard and do an example so I can walk you through this. Okay, this is going to be an RC circuit, a first order circuit. And so suppose we have a source connected to a resistor and a capacitor. So that's some source that is a DC value. Let's say you know that value it could be six volts. And that's, that's uh, connected to a switch and a resistor and a capacitor. And I think we talked about this last time, but it's worth mentioning again what's going to happen here. So you have uh, uh, a switch that's open before t equals zero, and then at t equals zero, you have the switch closing. You start off with an uncharged capacitor. Okay, so what's that mean? It means that this voltage here BC of T is zero for T less than zero. And that would be a given value. In other words, this capacitor could be charged. I could take this circuit. I could, I could take components and build this circuit. I could charge the capacitor, put it in the circuit, leave that switch open, the capacitor would maintain a charge and it would have a voltage on it until I give that uh, charge some place to flow. So this is a given for T less than zero, that capacitor is uncharged. So I have zero volts there. 
so let's do this. Let's let's find uh, the voltage B C of T for T greater than or equal to zero. That's when the interesting things happen. Okay, so imagine this capacitor has no charge on it, zero volts. This voltage is like something like six volts. You know R, you know C, and you close the switch. Well, you have zero volts here across the capacitor. You have maybe six volts here across the source. That means you have, by KVL, a voltage across that resistor. That means current will flow. So current is going to flow. It's going to start charging that capacitor. As that capacitor charges, the Q increases, right? The, the charge increases. Um, that means the capacitor's voltage rises, and it's going to rise exponentially, you'll see, until, well, the capacitor voltage reaches the source voltage, uh, practically reaches the source voltage, and the current stops flowing. Okay, so that, that uh, capacitor is going to charge uh, up to a point until Vc equals Vs. Let's write the equations that describe that. So for T greater than or equal to zero, that means this switch has closed. Right? I want to find um, some equation for VT because I'm look or VC of T. I'm looking for VC of T. Um, th this is part of that general approach that I, I talked about, the first approach. We do whatever we need to do to find some equation that has VC of T in it. It's going to be a differential equation because this is a first order circuit. So, um, and that capacitor voltage is going to change over time. So let's do this. I think, right, you just start trying things. And one of the things I tried, it's not the only way to do this, but it's one thing I tried, was let me solve for, or let me write an equation for the currents leaving this node that I circled that says I1 and I2. So I'm going to write a, a KCL equation. How do I do that? Um, well, I think an easy way to do this, a straightforward way to do this, is to just write a ground symbol there. So now this is my reference node down here. And that would mean that this voltage with the switch closed here is Vs, right? The node voltage there is Vs with that switch closed. And then the node voltage over here at the upper right corner is Vc of t. That will help me write two equations for I1 and I2. So what's I1 of t? I1 of t is the current through that resistor from one node voltage to another. Right, so this should look familiar. The current going from right to left through R is Vc of T, Vc of T minus Vs over R. And so that's I1, I2. T is equal to, well, that's the current through the capacitor. So the current through the capacitor, we, we talked about that when you, when you want to relate voltage to current for a capacitor, that is uh, C dV dt. Okay, so I have the current leaving to the left, I have the current leaving down, I can write a KCL equation. I1 of t, the current leaving, plus I2 of t, the other current leaving, equals zero. 
Now I can plug in these expressions for I1 and I2. So VC, so I'm going to plug this in for I1, VC of T minus VS over R. Right, that's that, plus I2, C, DVC, DT, that's I2 equals zero. Um, all right, so let's, let's multiply through by R, both sides by R, so R times the right, R times the left. And then I'm going to move the derivative to the left just to make it look more standard. So this term becomes RC DVC DT um, plus I get R times VC of T over R. So that R goes away equals VS. Right, so all I did is multiply the left and right by R and uh, rearranged. Okay. This is the form of the differential equation for a first order circuit that, that you will always wind up with. You wind up with something times the derivative of either voltage or current plus something, in this case one, times the voltage or current itself equals a constant. Right, so this, this will show up for every first order circuit, this form. And the great thing is that there's a form of the solution for this type of equation. When you have a constant times the derivative plus a constant times the variable itself equals a constant, then the form of the solution is this. BC of T. Right, what you're looking for, the solution to that differential equation is always going to be K1 plus K2 E to the ST. Okay, so the solution is always going to be a constant K1 plus constant K2 times this exponential term E to the ST, T is time. So our job is going to be to find K1, K2, and S. And that's it, right? So we're out of we're out of the circuits class and into differential equations now. And I'm going to show you my favorite way for solving the first order differential equation that you get from a from a first order circuit. Okay. All right. So remember, remember this form, right? I'm going to use that form. That's that's the form of the solution for a first order differential equation. Okay. Now let's apply this form of the solution to the specific equation that we got for this circuit. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in K1 plus K2 E to the ST in for VC here. And I'm going to write that up here. Okay. So you get RC times DVC DT. So I'll just write that as DDT. Right, I'm taking the derivative of K1 plus K2 E to the ST. Right, so I plug this into there. And now I'll plug that same form of the solution in for VC of T plus this K1 plus K2 E to the ST. That's a T. Equals VS. Okay, so that's just this equation that for this circuit with the form of the solution plugged in. All right, so let's let's start simplifying this here. Let's see, I'm going to get RC times the derivative of K1 plus K2E to the ST. The derivative of a constant is zero, so the K1 goes away 
the derivative of e to the st is s e to the st. So I get k2 s e to the st. plus k1 plus k2, I'm just writing this again, e to the st equals vs, okay? So I've just gotten rid of the derivative. And remember, our goal is to come down here and find k1, k2, and s. So, so this is that form of a solution plugged into this differential equation that I wrote here. And we have to find k1, k2, and s, and we're done. Okay. So, yes. So that equation K1 plus K2 EST, that's just a, like a known solution? Mm -hmm. Every, so if, if you have, if you have a differential equation that is some value, I'll just say A times um, DX of T DT plus B X of T. That's an X, like a variable, equals C, right? X could be any function, right? Or I should say X, X is what you're looking for. It's not any function, it's what you're looking for. A first order differential equation, that's some constant times the derivative plus another constant times that function itself equals a constant will always have this form right here. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So now we have to find K1, K2, and S. So I'm going to rearrange this expression right here, this equation, such that I have a time varying term plus a constant equals a constant. Let me show you what I mean. I want to get this e to the st into, into, into one term. OK, so I'm going to do this, and then we'll check if I did this right. Let's concentrate on this these two terms, this rc k2 s e to the st and this k2 e to the st. Let's see if we can form one term. Let's see. There's a k2 in both of those. There's a K2 in both of those. In this term, there's an R, C, and an S. Right, R, C, and S, K2, S, T. And then in this one, there's a, it's just a K2, E to the S, T. Okay, let's see if I did that right. <clears throat> this term is K2, R, C, S, K2, R, C, S, times E to the S, T. This term, is K2 times one e to the st. So I think I did that right. Plus, let's see what's left over here. K1 on the left equals Vs. Trust me, this will make life really easy, really quickly. Okay, let's talk about this equation for a minute. Um, <clears throat> this term right here, varies with time, right? And it, like, we know it does something, it's an exponential, but I'm just gonna schematically or just conceptually saying it, it, it does something, right? It goes, it just, it changes with time, right? With time. So it's changing value, not before t equals zero, but there. And, and this value here is a constant, right? It's a constant with time. And this value here is a constant with time, all right? So you have something that, it doesn't exactly do that, it does something like this, but it changes with time. Um, and you add that to a constant and somehow you get a constant, right? This plus this plus this equals this. That can't be, right? You can't, you can't take a, you can't take a function that looks like this, add it to a constant and get a constant, right? This on the right-hand side would have to be changing. If this is changing plus a constant, that would have to be changing. So this has to go away. I've got to make this go away. I've got to make that equal zero, 
right? Before I erase this, does that make sense? Does anyone not get that? That, you know, you can't have something that changes with time added to a constant and then get a constant, right? Or, or if there's questions about that, let's, let's talk about that. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna make this term go away. I want to make this term go to zero somehow so that this equation makes sense. Okay, so keep that concept in mind. So those scribbly plots were saying that uh, that this this has to this has to equal zero, right? Somehow, oops. Let's stop it right there. The coefficient of e to the st has to go to zero. Okay. Well, I could do that a couple ways. I could make k two zero, right? If I make k two zero, then this term goes away. But the thing is. I'll, I'll show you why K2 cannot be zero, because remember when we started this conversation about the circuit, I said that this voltage is going to vary over time. This capacitor starts out with zero charge, and then, and then the capacitor charges up. And as the capacitor charges, that means the voltage is changing, right? So if the voltage is changing, well, K2 cannot be zero, right? Because if K2 were zero, that means V C of T is equal to con a constant. V C of T is not a constant. So K2 cannot be zero. Okay, let's see. So why can't, someone asked in the chat, why can't S just be equal to zero so that um, E to the ST is equal to one? Well, if, S, okay, that's a, good, that's a great question. But if S were zero, you'd have the same problem over here, right? You'd have VC of T equals K1 plus K2. And that would mean that this voltage is a constant. We know that voltage isn't a constant. It changes because this capacitor charges, but that, that's a good question. Okay, so K2 is not zero. So how else do we make this term go away? How about we make this zero, right? We make that RCS plus one equal zero, and that will make that term go away. Okay. Let's see. So that means that RCS plus one equals zero. Okay, and what does that mean? That means, let's see, we can solve for S. S equals minus one over RC. R is known, C is known, we've just solved for S. Okay, any questions on how I did that? Just said that has to be zero, so now we've solved for S. Okay. All right. Um, now that I've made this term go away, right, this is now zero, K1 equals Vs. There's my second of three constants that I need to find for this form of the solution. All right. Now we have to solve for K2, because K2 is not zero, so let's solve for K2. We're going to use um, the initial condition. The initial condition is, is the voltage uh, of the capacitor right after T equals zero, okay? Right after that switch closes. So, so that's what we want to find. We want to find VC, uh, of zero plus. Let me start first start talking about VC of zero minus, right? VC of zero minus, that means right before that switch closes, what is VC 
what's the value of VC? Well, we said it was zero, right? For T less than zero, the capacitor is uncharged. It's zero volts. Now, how do I get to VC of zero plus? Because that's what we want. We want the capacitor voltage um, right after T equals zero. And I'll, I'll show you how that comes into play. We're gonna use We're gonna use the initial condition to solve using this equation down here. But first let's figure out what this is. Okay, so how do I get from here to here from zero minus to zero plus? Well, remember that you have to take into consideration the voltage versus current relationship for a capacitor. Right, I is equal to C dV dt. And here's what this says. This says that I cannot have the capacitor voltage uh, change instantaneously. In other words, if this is like Vc of t and this is time, like I, I, can I need to have a nice smooth transition uh, from one point in time to the next. I can't do this. I can't like change and then all of a sudden go straight up. I can't do that. That's supposed to be straight up and down because that slope would be infinity and that would require infinite current, okay? And, and so VC of T cannot change instantaneously or the derivative is zero. You can't even have, you know, you know make, I don't know, make, another, make another instantaneous change. You're coming, maybe you're coming down and then, you know, doing something like that. This would be negative infinity. You would still need negative infinite current. So you have to have a continuous change uh, in voltage for a capacitor. And that applies at zero too, right? You can't have like some zero voltage and then jump up all of a sudden to some other voltage. That can't happen. You can't have an instant, instantaneous change, which means that right before T equals zero and right after T equals zero, the voltage has to be the same. So that means VC of T or VC of zero plus equals zero because of this because this can't happen. And, and so we're just gonna call that uh, the initial condition VC of zero, which is zero minus, which is zero plus, squeeze, go, you know, take the limit as that delta T goes to zero. So VC of zero equals zero, write that down a little bit. Okay, so now we can find K2 using this right here in the lower left, because we know Vc of zero, Vc of t, equals K1 plus K2 E to the S times T equals zero. Okay, so E, to the zero is one, right? This is one. And so that means K2 equals minus K1, right? Move K1 to the other side of the equal sign. So now we have found all three values that we need to get the solution for this differential equation for this circuit. All right, let's fill, let's fill in the values then. So VC of T equals, uh, let's see, K1 plus K2 E to the ST. That's going to be K1 is VS. K2 is minus K, uh, minus K1 case, minus Vs. That's K2. E to the ST, that's minus T times one over RC. I'm sorry about that, getting squished here. Minus T times one over RC.
So that's that is the value for uh, t greater than or equal to zero. That's the solution. If I were to write the complete solution, right? It's v c of t for all time equals. Let's see. It's zero for t less than zero, and then it's v s minus v s e to the minus t over r c for t greater than or equal to zero. So that's the whole solution there for vc of t. All right, so that's that's the process in an example. You have a circuit, you figure out some way to write KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, voltage division, whatever you need to do to get the differential equation. Once you have that differential equation, you can solve this differential equation any way you want. I recommend doing this. I think this is pretty easy. Um, you get, uh, you have the general form of the solution. Whatever you're looking for, if this is a current, this would say I of T equals K1 plus K2 E to the ST. You're always going to have this, this form of the solution. You plug that into the equation that you derived. Solve by forming that equation such that you have a time varying term plus a constant equals a constant. You'll always wind up with that. Make the time varying term go away, recognizing that K2 cannot be zero, right? That will give you S and K1 once that time varying term goes away. Then use the initial condition for the value you're looking for, for the variable you're looking for to find K2 and then plug those three terms into this general equation here. Okay. So you'll get some practice on homework with that. Um, I'll also show you the second way. So this is, this, is, this is the first way of solving an RC circuit or any first order circuit. The other circuit would be an RL circuit. We will work also an example there. But does anyone have any questions on, on what I did here um, before? We won't have to derive this. This is just like showing us how it's done because. Right, well, well, actually this is the step. You, 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 if you use the first approach, right? There are circuits where the first approach is actually the better way to go. You, you will have to, so th this, you will have to find this equation. You'll have to do a KCL or whatever to find the differential equation. That's what you'll have to do, yes. And, and then however you want to solve that differential equation, there are, are other ways. Solve that differential equation to get the function you're looking for. This is the way that I solve that differential equation. Right. Okay. Let's see. So someone says in the chat, if so, if the circuit looks different than the example, this is no longer applicable. So right. So if the circuit looks different, this equation is no longer applicable this equation is right this will always be the the general solution this this always works for a first order circuit this is specific to this circuit okay Any other questions on, on this before we move on? All right.
Okay, so the time varying nature of the first order circuit is described by um, a time constant um, and also by a steady state solution. So we're gonna talk about time constants and steady state. We'll dig into what that response, that transient response looks like. And what that will do is that'll lead us into the second way of solving these circuits, which I think is easier and can be applied to many circuits. So let's take a look at time constants and steady state. So this is the circuit we just solved. Let's say you know Vs, you know R, you know, you know C, and you know the time at which the switch closes. We got this solution, right? This is the solution that we, 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 we found. Let's throw some values in here. Let's suppose you know it's a 12 volt source, a 1K ohm resistor and a 10 microfarad capacitor. I could fill those values in for the solution for T greater than or equal to zero. You'd get this 12 minus 12, e to the minus 100t. If I plot that, I would see this. So this is voltage across the capacitor versus time. And this is the exponential rise, starting at one value, converging at another value. That will always be the case for a first order circuit that has a, a transient response or I should say every, every voltage that changes will have this exponential characteristic. It will look something like that. It'll either rise, it'll fall, but it starts at one value, goes to another. Now, what, what voltages don't change? Well, for example, the voltage across the source doesn't change, right? The current changes through it, but the voltage across that source doesn't change. So that 12 volts will always be 12 volts. It won't be an exponential. But all the transient responses will look like, like this. They will have an, an initial value. They'll start somewhere. They will have some kind of exponential change. And they will have what looks like a final value, right? This looks like it, it converges. It converges at some value and then just stays there. Now, in reality, this exponential rate never goes to zero. But if you take the limit as t goes to infinity, right? e to the minus infinity is zero. So it'll get pretty close to a constant um, at some point. So let's talk about describing this characteristic. So I have this response. This looks like the response on the previous slide, except I've normalized here. I've said, well, it starts at maybe zero. It doesn't have to start at zero. And then it goes to one. So I've really just normalized the value. And here's some normalized time that we'll talk about. It's normalized to the time constant, but that's just every, every response is going to look like this. This is called the transient response. So the transient starts when the sudden change is made and the transient ends when the voltage here looks constant enough. Okay, constant enough. Well, there's a convention we use for constant enough. We say that when, when the value is converged to within 90, uh, with, well, 99% of its final value, right? It's within 1% of its final value. It's 99% of the way there. We say we have reached steady state. That value looks DC enough, okay? Um, and so we're calling that the steady state value. So anything to the left, any value that is changing in time, that's the transient response. Any value that looks constant after a transient is a steady state response. It's just a constant value, it's steady. So voltages and currents in first order circuits will have this exponential term. They will always have the form e to the minus t over tau, right? Here's your time variable. This is the time constant. Tau is the time constant. Let me, let me say something here. We used tau when integrating. We used tau as a dummy variable when integrating um, 
you know, voltage or current, when we looked at the, the integral form of voltage for current for, uh, for capacitors and inductors. This is a different tau, okay? This is not just a dummy variable for integration. This is a value we're going to call the time constant. It's in units of seconds and it characterizes the response time. It's, what's that mean? That means it tells you how quickly does the voltage change from an initial value to a final value? What's that look like? Okay, and you can see here when I've normalized time to tau, it looks like, well, we're right about converging at five time constants. In fact, that's where ta tau comes from. That's where five time constants comes from for convergence. At five time constants, the voltage or current is within 1% of reaching its final value. Okay, how do I know that? Because if you plug in here, if you plug in T equals five tau, right, T equals five tau, you get E to the minus five, which is 0.7%, which is less than 1%. So it's, it's, it's within 1%. The value is within 1% of its final value. Okay. Um, and so after five tau, we say that the circuit has reached steady state. And this happens not only for rising voltages and currents, it also happens for falling voltages and currents. So you'll have a, if you have a voltage or a current that starts at a value and goes to a different value, right? Th th this still applies. You still have a transient response going in the other direction. Um, but it starts at a value, ends at a value, that's the transient. And after five time constants, steady state is reached. In fact, for, for all voltages, all currents in a first order circuit, all of those voltages and currents that do change, they all have the same time constant. They all start at some value. And after five time constants, they will reach steady state. So let's take a look at determining the time constant. Right, so here is that circuit again, right? Um, the time constant is contained in, in this exponential right here. So that exponential, e to the minus t over rc, I can equate that to e, to e to the minus t over tau, right? That's the form of the exponential. And so uh, let's see, you just, you could see rc, uh, and tau are in the same position in this term, so tau equals RC. So in this case, you have e to the minus 100T. Equate that to e to the minus T over tau, and you get tau equals 1 over 100, or 10 milliseconds. So practically, that means if you built this circuit in lab, you connect an oscilloscope, you make it trigger off of the, you know, the rising voltage, you would get something that looks like this. It would start at some point when your trigger happened on the oscilloscope, it would rise, and at 50 milliseconds, right, freeze the screen, 50 milliseconds, you would see about DC after that point, after that point in time. Okay. All right. So that's what the time constant describes. It describes how long it takes for the transient to go from one voltage to another voltage. So after after a circuit has been after a circuit has reached steady state or five tau, we can make some simple assumptions to analyze the circuit to solve for voltages and currents. So I'm leading up to that second, I think, easier way to solve for first order circuit transient responses. Take a capacitor, for example. Capacitors in a circuit. Um, We've talked about I is equal to C dV dt. In steady state, once the circuit has reached steady state, uh, the voltage isn't changing anymore, right? The voltage is a constant. So the derivative of a constant is zero. So I is equal to C times zero if V is a constant, right? So I of T is equal to zero. So for a capacitor in steady state, that means it can be replaced with zero amps or an open. So when we're doing steady state analysis, we will work an example. When we're doing steady state analysis, we replace capacitors with opens. Right. We will work an example of that. 
when we're working with inductors, we know V is equal to L di dt. That's the relationship. But in steady state, di dt is zero because I is not changing. Like I is constant. You've reached steady state. I is a constant. The derivative of a constant is zero. So di dt is zero. That means that V is equal to L times zero, which is zero. We can replace the inductor with a short. A short is zero volts, right? So you take in steady state, only in steady state, you take the inductors and you replace those inductors with shorts to make zero volts happen. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, next time, we're going to work examples of solving for voltages and currents in a circuit that we know has reached steady state. Okay, so we'll work on that next time. Okay, so for now I've hit the wall on time. So in closing, uh, the exam solutions are posted. So take a look at those. If you have any questions about those solutions or your grades, stop by office hours. I'd be glad to help with that. There's a pre-lab due this week. There's a lab you're going to be doing this week. Uh, take a look at that. Thanks for joining the live class. I appreciate you joining. I think it helps so you can ask questions and we can interact. I hope everything is working out well. Please let me know if anything isn't. I will start office hours in just a few seconds. So stick around if you'd like to chat. If not, I will see you next time and have a great night.